So thank you, Matthias. Please stay on stage. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome Marcus back on stage and also invite uh, uh, James Barlow back on Zoom. Uh, I know we're a few minutes uh, ahead of schedule, so but James seems to be ready. Well, I'm, I'm here, yes. Yeah. Excellent, great, thank you. Um, so um, we've heard what Region Halland and Halmstad University are working on, and we've talked about in the, in the beginning of this morning uh, how the National Life Science Strategy might tie into this. And just now we've deep dived into federated learning and data privacy, etc. So James, is this compatible with your views on 21st century health innovation? What, what can we do differently? What are some pitfalls? Um, I think it's, uh, I think that was a fascinating uh, series of three talks. Uh, I, I was very impressed um, by what's going on in Halland. Um, I mean, I, I think it picks up some of the themes that I um, mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, just to give you my sort of summary and take on, on what I've heard, uh, I, I, I like the idea of this value chain of knowledge um, that Marcus mentioned. Um, and I think we're clearly moving from the, the, the left to the right on that continuum. Um, and, and I think um, Philip showed, you know, that there, there's huge potential of data when coupled with advanced analytics to deliver um, improvements in the health system, um, whether they be, you know, personalized care, personalized um, um, uh, you know, uh, medicine, um, predictive modeling, or, you know, exploring the impact of interventions before you make them. Um, huge, huge potential of data, I think. Um, and I think in Holland, you know, clearly there's a lot going on. Uh, you've had some success, um, but, but I would say, from my perspective, it's early days. Um, we've heard, heard about some very big challenges. Um, um, Marcus talking about silos and stakeholder engagement um, and the need to collaborate across domains and um, knowledge communities. Uh, I, th I think one of the big issues that I've um, picked up in, in recent months looking at this topic um, is the lack of a sort of common shared understanding um, of what AI actually is and, and what it can do and, and, and what we mean by data-driven care. I think different groups, different people have, have different perspectives on that. Um, so, so I think there's still a huge uh, um, effort that's needed around engagement of different stakeholders within local health systems um, around this uh, question of data-driven care um, and what it is and what it can do. Um, I also think that Matthias gave a great overview of the um, technical complexity of uh, putting in place these privacy preserving approaches um, and clearly if we're going to scale information driven um, healthcare efforts up to the wider system then this is one of the huge huge things that needs to be addressed um, but yeah I mean just going back to my sort of earlier points uh, clearly it's very much part of the sort of 21st century model that I talked about um, with end users at the heart, um, with services being much more personalized around your needs, um, um, with data being used to drive value added solutions, whether they be at a patient level or wider system level. Um, and I think also what's interesting about the effort in Halland for me is that, um, it, it, just to go back to my earlier points about um, the sort of power imbalance between global tech giant suppliers and health systems. Um, it does show that you can do it um, in a sort of locally driven and locally controlled way. Um, so I may have left the impression that it's a slightly gloomy perspective um, in my talk earlier this morning. Um, but uh, I think what, what you're doing is showing that uh, it, it, it can be done at a local level. So uh, very impressive uh, um, effort, I think, in, in Holland. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm curious, does this mean then that healthcare providers will need to program AI services in the future? Um, if we, if we talk, or what does the interface between this technology and the healthcare professionals daily work really look like? Can you give us a sense of 
uh, are there new skills that we need to be teaching at medical schools, for example, for training our future healthcare professionals? Uh, yes, indeed, is okay. the short answer. And the little bit longer answer is that we, uh, as physicians, at, at least need to be able to understand these, uh, uh, these uh, tools and, and the shortcomings of, of clinical decision support systems and other supporting tools and, and that goes also for healthcare management which will also be using these tools when when uh, prioritizing uh, across different uh, uh, alternatives uh, and alternative ways forward so uh, i think the interface um, no physicians will not be the programmers because you cannot be uh, both a well-trained physician and a well-trained programmer, and that's kind of the point with collaboration, that you need to understand each other so that you uh, work together going forward. Uh, but uh, the frontline uh, usage of these tools will um, hopefully, and I, I'm convinced uh, eventually, be fully integrated so that, that they feel completely natural and trustworthy uh, to, to the patient, the inhabitant, and the, the provider. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, because if you in invent tools that takes effort to understand and use, well, that will nudge you in another way. Right. So in order to arrive at this well-designed system, uh, we have received a question that really uh, uh, strikes home for me at least as a human-centered designer. Uh, the, the question is how early in the innovation process uh, do you involve the service users or do you have service designers here or is it more of a technological experimentation and then you shove that solution into the organization? So uh, I take it as uh, what we're doing now uh, and, and this is basically why you are there and I'm here uh, <laughs> because we want, don't want to delay that collaboration saying Matthias coming saying hey we have this super cool federated learning trained model with a, a predictive capacity of 99 point uh, super 9% uh, and, and but it's completely unuseful so and that that's where we uh, have the showstopper between the uh, the uh, innovation and the value creation right. uh, and that cannot happen that's where that's in the ditch where where uh, Matthias finds all these very good uh, models that could really provide value and, and patient safety and, 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 and decrease patient harm, but they didn't reach that final stage of, mm. of innovation. And, yeah. and that's so sad, but, but uh, I'm convinced that we will get there because uh, the, the big nine that, uh, that uh, James uh, mentioned realized that the potential here is huge and the challenges that we share all across the globe in healthcare uh, are you also huge so we cannot just leave it at that knowing those problems without tackling them yeah. so, so this is a collaborative effort yeah. <laughs> we need to collaborate we need to put in in uh, expertise from uh, many many different areas in order to actually make use of, of, of what we develop. Yep. So, uh, yeah. I well, I'm personally happy to hear that there is room for uh, service designers and UX <laughs> designers in this space. Uh, that's excellent. So moving on to uh, human-machine interaction then, what's the status or vision regarding a fully connected human, imagining a constant sensor monitoring, real-time uh, cloud services, um, predicting what your next uh, move would be? tracking blood oxygen, uh, like the new Apple Watch will, for example. What, what's the, how does that play into the visions that you guys are working on? Is that a goal in itself? While you are thinking, I have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the device I want to have when I'm playing tennis and boating. Uh, uh, when you're 80. When I'm 80, yeah. uh, referring back to your previous yeah. question. So uh, 
monitoring my health in a way that is well protected and I feel safe with it and, and no uh, evil enterprise will uh, misuse uh, the data uh, in, in a secondary way that I didn't approve of, uh, but still warning me in good time when I should stop playing tennis or go into shore and, and, hmm. and, and uh, look for support uh, of any kind. So that's, and we are really, really closing in on that stage. So, so I, I think we will be there far before I, I turn 80, because that's very, very, very far away. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sure. uh, and uh, through different devices, uh, and the Apple Watch is certainly one early one, yeah. uh, but there is a, an abundance of, of solutions and devices that, that will uh, be utilized. And if we internalize them in healthcare, it's, it's a bit more difficult because mm -hmm. we have other legislations and regulations to refer to. Uh, but uh, as consumer products, they will be adopted rapidly uh, by, by us all, I believe, because they facilitate our lives yep. uh, uh, in, in fascinating ways. Yeah. Uh, Matthias, did no, you want to No, I mean, I mean we, we, you can certainly see bits and pieces here of everywhere wh where you have incredible tech. Uh, you have the watches, you have surgeons that can operate uh, AI methods uh, helping in, th in that respect. But of course, we want to, in, an, uh, in, in the future, we want to pull as much as that together into to something that can monitor every piece of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And James? I, I, I would, yeah, I mean, I would just... <laughs> Um, we, with my sort of innovation management uh, uh, hat on, um, I, I would guard against these sort of uh, super optimistic views of uh, the technology and, and, and how easy it will be to integrate it into existing systems. Um, and uh, d d just remind people that um, the first paper published in a scientific journal about telemedicine was uh, possibly that in the Lancet in 1879, um, as, as soon as we had telephones, um, and, and telemedicine may have escalated massively in the last few months. But um, uh, the problem is never the technology. You know, it, it's always getting it um, embedded in the existing uh, complexity of the, the organizational system. Um, uh, and um, sorry, that's my phone. There's a bit of technology. Speaking of telemedicine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, 90% uh, um, uh, of the challenge is human and organizational, I think, and 10% and, and, um, is actually developing the technology. So we can have all the, you know, the Fitbits and all, all, all the other devices, um, but how you actually make really good use of that data, um, how you integrate it into the system um, in a way that uh, is, uh, you know, supports our, our privacy and so on. Um, who pays for what actually in the terms of the business models is, is a much, much bigger question than the um, development of the technology and, and, and the systems around it. And perhaps also uh, paying with what? Uh, it's not only uh, money, that is the only resource, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but uh, hesitate a little bit when I heard, uh, I think it was, I forget. One of you talked about mortality prediction. I, th I think it was you, Matthias. I, I just mentioned a, yeah. a, a study, yes. M mortality prediction, is that what I think it is? That uh, somebody saying, well, there's a 30% likelihood you will die within this um, time period. Yes. Is, is that what it is? Yeah. OK. So that's an interesting uh, <laughs> philosophical question, right? Um, d do we want that information as humans? <coughs> I will, you will probably have a comment, but my first comment is, is that if we have such a technology, I'm not sure that that information is most useful for the patient. It could perhaps be more useful for the healthcare system in trying to prevent that from happening. But still, <laughs> I mean, that, that's just pushing that uh, knowledge a little bit. I mean, if we as patients know that the healthcare system or professional might actually have a figure, on my, um, w wouldn't we just ask the doctor to provide that? What's my mortality uh, <laughs> rate? And and would we would we want to know that? I, I I can add to that. My big surprise is that everyone is so surprised that this is doable because <laughs> this is what we do all the time in healthcare. Uh, um, 
actually trying to understand the the prediction uh, or rather the prognosis of yes. you as an individual now we have sharper tools uh, but uh, this is, has been done uh, yeah. since the beginning of medicine, of course. Uh, so that we can say, hey, for you, uh, with, with your late stage cancer, uh, you would only suffer for more from us treating you more aggressively. We would like to give you uh, symptomatic treatment so that at least the, the, the time you have left will, have, will be a... a a, a fairly good time. Yeah. So, so this is just um, as a physician, I this is my ev everyday work. And, and, and for uh, people not being used to dealing with life and death daily, uh, it might be scary. I, I I can understand that, but that's that's what we work with. Yeah, but, but I'm I'm thinking maybe the the. What's new here uh, compared to ancient medicine is that all of a sudden we have a figure and we know that machine learning has always an error or accuracy. Uh, we're not always 100%. So if you have a 94% um, error in that, you, you, that means that 6% will get the wrong um, answer. Yeah, and the only difference is that the 6% is a bit uh, lower number than the models we had before. Yeah. Uh, okay. So... Um, yeah, no news. Sorry, no but, news. But better, <laughs> but, but better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any comments on that, James? Well, I, I, I just I'd be interested to hear um, uh, the thoughts about your thoughts about um, uh, people's attitudes to risk, really, and 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 uh, you know, if, if you're told you've got a ninety-four percent chance of X. Um, do you really think this will change people's behavior? I mean, l a lot of the challenge in addressing future health system problems is around uh, behavior change, I think, um, getting us to, to, you know, to shift our behavior and move towards healthier lifestyles and so on. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just sort of interested in your views on, um, you know, how, how much, to what extent can people take on board uh, um, these discussions around the risk of particular outcomes. Um, I mean, we've seen this with you know, coronavirus. Um, people talk about you know one million chance, one in one million chance of dying or whatever, and people's behaviour doesn't really change. So um, yeah, what's 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 the feeling about uh, our ability to sort of comprehend risk? I, I would say there is much more than feelings around that subject. There's uh, a fair amount of science on our inability to handle risk, and specifically mm. risk uh, described in a figure or a number, uh, which is, uh, and this is. Um, part of the nudging uh, uh, domain, actually, even saying that, well, you have a 9% risk of surviving this surgery. Fantastic, I'll take the chance. Or I approach you with saying, hey, this is a good surgery, but, but there's uh, one ri uh, risk in 20 that you will not survive it. Same information, different approaches, different reactions. Or if, what if I would have say, said, well, uh, there's an 80% uh, risk of, uh, or chance of success uh, in, in this treatment. How much is that? Is that a lot or a little? Or, and that, uh, I think, is very individual. Mm -hmm. or, and I don't only think it, there are studies on this. And it, it comes from uh, starting in the field of behavioral economics, actually, where we, uh, from, from uh, Daniel Kahneman and, and later on Richard Taylor and uh, and uh, and his team developing into uh, behavioral psychology, which is very interesting in 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 this uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we have a lot more to think and discuss about there. Yeah, I can add a little here. So I, I I've seen small small local studies where where people were to translate a a probability number into statements like uh, low, high, intermediate, high, very high. And uh, 
it's amazing to see when you do such small studies that you, you get scattered all over that uh, scale of, of statements. So different people interpret a 0.3 many, many different ways. Hmm. And the study here was among physicians at the hospital. So, so I even perhaps ones that are, are dealing with that numbers in, in their profession. So for me, this is part of the implementation process. This is part of where we need to study how should we perhaps uh, communicate such a number back, to whom should we communicate it back, and in what way, such that we, 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 we avoid these mistakes and avoid misinterpretations. I, uh, and I really think that is, is extremely important. And for me, this is part of, of the challenges of implementation. And it varies from application to application. Yeah, uh, uh, but also I would like to add that uh, we are all, including us physicians, biased in this sense. And, and to me, uh, we are trying to reach uh, equal care for all. And it shouldn't be a matter of who, which physician or nurse you uh, happen to meet that day and the shape he or she is in yeah. based on being up all night with kids or whatever. So, so uh, making uh, decision making m less biased and less individual uh, could, um, uh, could move the decision making to the individual who is, who is uh, uh, actually uh, carrying the, the health situation. And that's not the physician or the healthcare system. Right. Uh, that's that's you. Wow, it's me, uh, James. Any uh, final closing comments? Uh, well, I don't think uh, there's more to add. Really, I mean, I, I, it's. Um, I, I just go back to my point that, um, which has been borne out in the last few couple of minutes. You know, uh, implementation is sort of multifaceted, and um, it, it it also needs to involve individuals and uh, and and you know bring the public along with you um, as well as individual uh, clinicians and and nurses and everybody else connected with the health system so that gets back to my point about the language we use and uh, developing a shared understanding of um, data driven care and uh, and 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 what it means for everybody so Probably that's it for yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ongoing discussion then. So um, uh, I uh, think we need to close this section down. Uh, so thank you so much, James, for joining us again. And thank you, Matthias, and thank Thanks. you, Marcus.